Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Money Level Show where we think, act, and prosper. Today, we have a special show for you all. Today, we are joined by Rick Rule, and you all know Rick from Rule Investment Media, Battle Bank, all of those things, and also Sean Wade of Power Metal Resources. How y'all doing today? Very well indeed, Daryl. Thank you very much. This all is doing great, Daryl. Uh, the better for being back on with you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So there's been some huge news in the nuclear sector. Uh, we've we've had the big tech companies are coming out writing big checks, right? Um, they we had Microsoft uh, with the uh, Three Mile Island. We've had Amazon uh, sign uh, sign a deal to uh, bring on uh, some of the uh, small modular reactors. We had some news from Google as well, and so. These big companies are coming out and they're 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 wanting to power these data centers uh, for AI and such. And even NVIDIA, the biggest uh, one of the biggest tech companies right now, have been even talking about nuclear as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if any news comes out of that. Uh, so, uh, Rick, I, I want to uh, go to you first. Was this something that 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 you expected? Was this on your radar? I know we've been talking about uranium for a while, but. This this is something that this is big. Daryl, I was dismissive of the SMR uh, until a conference call that I was on about seven months ago <clears throat> when I was listening to a discussion of SMR technology. And a guy from the U.S. Navy said, this technology isn't new. The U.S. Navy has been deploying it for 35 years. So don't talk about SMR technology is new. <laughs> We've had nuclear submarines around the world with SMRs on them for a very long time. <clears throat> I would caution your listeners to understand that increases in uranium demand as a consequence of SMR reactors <clears throat> won't be consequential for five or 10 years. So understand that what this does is it increases the demand for nuclear. What it does in the near term more, however, is it changes the political reality. It changes the narrative around uranium. To have the big tech companies say to the economy as a whole, the only option that we have for reliable non-carbon generating power is nuclear is something that resonates today while the demand occurs five years or 10 years from now the political reality of the change impacts us today you will note too that with regards to three mile island they were willing to pay a stabilized power cost that is as much as double the stabilized power cost from the grid to have access to non-interruptible challenge uh, power that isn't held hostage to the fragility of the grid uh, or the uncertainty of things like wind and solar, uh, the highest quality power consumers in the world are willing to pay twice the current price for non-carbon generating 24-7 power. This is huge, Daryl. This is absolutely huge. In and of itself, much more important than the SMR news. Understand that SMRs impact demand uh, five years from now, 10 years from now. But the delay of nuclear, shut, nuclear plant shutdowns, which is happening around the world today, the restart of the European fleet, and particularly the restart of the Japanese fleet, uh, this impacts uranium de demand tomorrow, not 10 years from now. And in particular, the advent of the term market where uranium producers can lock in prices and volumes for 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years, where the uranium industry isn't subject to the vagaries of the spot market. While this is boring, this impacts demand today. So think of the SMRs as important icing on the cake. Think of the cake as one that's expanding as we speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. That's, I mean, the the SMRs is, is a great technology. I've I've been researching a little more into the um, micro uh, reactors as well, and so these new technologies are coming out. But you know, the demand, you know, uh, for these technology, that's that's one thing. And then you mentioned like, but you actually need the yellow cake, right? We actually need the 
the uranium to to even fuel these these new technologies. And so um, I do want to talk a little bit about the the term market. So some of these big tech companies are signing with um, the um, these utility companies who go in and buy uh, uranium and such from from producers and such. And so um, it, could you speak a little bit to the to the term market? Like where, where are things looking there? Let's. Let's say that Sean is uh, lucky enough in one of his companies to discover 100 million pounds of uranium. Okay. Traditionally, uh, Sean would be stuck with trying to raise $500 million or some number like that to build the mine. And off a small balance sheet, that's very tough to do. What's changed in uranium is that Sean can get that mine built on a turnkey basis by Westinghouse, which is now part of Cameco. In other words, he knows what his mine construction is going to be. And he's able to sell 5 million pounds a year to an investment grade counterparty, a China General Nuclear, a Tokyo Electric Power, a Duke company, a Southern companies. Uh, he can take that purchase pot contract with an investment grade counterparty literally to the bank. Literally to the bank. Uh, which means that Sean doesn't have to sell this deposit to Cameco, doesn't have to sell it to Arano. He can. But the fact that the market sees he can build it himself adds competitive tension to the deal process. That's very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. The other way around, uh, looking at it from the consumer's point of view, if you're building, let's say that we're looking at new technology, and let's say rather than Sean, we're talking about Daryl now, and Daryl's a promoter of a small modular, small modular reactor in, say, Wyoming, and this SMR is going to cost him a billion dollars. Uh, and he's able to raise 350 million in equity, the bank's going to have to give him 650 million. And what the bank is going to do is the bank is going to make Daryl uh, contract for enough uranium supply in the term market over 10 or 15 years to amortize that $650 million loan. So Daryl is going to have to talk to Sean. <laughs> Uh, and they're going to have to talk to each other in the contract market. Uh, this set of circumstances, Daryl, doesn't exist in any other commodity on the face of the earth. I mean, in Met Coal, you sign two-year contracts. In the iron business, you sign one-year contract. But nobody other than uranium, uh, in no other uh, commodity, is it common to sign 10 or 15 or 20-year terms. This is just unheralded, and it's wonderful. Wow. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, so, Sean, I, I want to give you the floor uh, because I know Power Metals, uh, the the company focuses in the Athabasca Basin and and has some projects there. And so, I want to give you an opportunity to speak to just some of the sentiment that you're seeing. I mean, you're 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 sh out there shaking hands, you know, meeting folks and and trying to close deals and everything. And so, I want to get the sentiment of what what you're seeing and kind of your your perspective on on this big news that's been coming out yeah thanks daryl and and look you know i heartily agree with everything that's that's uh, that rick has said there and and it is a very very exciting time for us to have such a major investment uh in in this in uh, uranium but i think it's important for the listeners also to understand that we are at the exploration and discovery end here um not yet into development and into production so Although um, Rick is absolutely right that as soon as we have that major discovery, we will be entering into those conversations. At the moment, what we're focusing on is the early stage exploration work that's going to define our drill targets. And from there, we hope to make commercial discoveries. And now, I know we've spoken a bit about uh, what kind of asset set we've got in Uranium, but just to recap on that. Um, so my predecessor as CEO at Power Metals, um, Paul Johnson, I think had the vision to to stake out what is amounted to around about a thousand square kilometers of licensed area in and around Athabasca, <clears throat> pardon me, in, in and around the Athabasca Basin at a time when the uranium price was sort of languishing in the sort of $30 a pound uh, sort of range. And it's now, as we know, it's sort of in the high 80s uh, dollars a pound. It has been recently a little higher and, and obviously we're all expecting it to go higher still. Um, and at a time when there was, I think, you know, perhaps still debate about uh, nuclear's role in the energy mix, a, a debate, I think, an argument, I think certainly has been won, and not just by the arguments that Rick has made, but also just in the overall terms of, you know, the decarbonisation cycle. 
Um, so we staked out this larger area of, of, of land and we were looking at, as we do as an incubator, looking at the way to optimize the value of that land uh, and to get the best returns for our shareholders. Now, there were a number of routes we, we could have taken. We considered doing a small spin out IPO of a few of the properties, which would have given us a, a price discovery mechanism for the balance of the portfolio. But then obviously you're getting into lots of conversations about funding options and so on. But we took the the whole project, we, we took the whole lot, if you like, to um, to a, a, an investor in, in London uh, called ACAM LP, which a lot of people will know through other investments they've made, in particular, the Gardak uh, transaction in, in um, Greenland, for example. And we we actually, we took our IPO idea to them and said, look, this is what we're trying to do. And they said, I, I tell you what's a better idea is to take the whole portfolio, do this properly, commit uh, a major exploration budget to it, and then really go after those discoveries. You know, as we all know, and as, and as Rick will know best, better than most, you know, what separates most junior mining companies from the discoveries is not necessarily the geology and the geochemistry. It's it's the cash you have available to do those high impact drill programs that are needed. So what we discussed with them and what we've completed very recently in the, in the last couple of weeks is a joint venture agreement with uh, the vehicle is actually called UCAM that, that derives from the, the ACAM fund. Uh, and they're taking a 70% stake in our entire uranium business. And, and they're putting in $10 million of exploration budget, which I believe is the second highest exploration budget that's going into the Athabasca region at the moment. It's certainly one of the highest exploration budgets. So it gives us a fantastic chance to make those, those discoveries. And of course, as we all know, there's a there's a long period between discovery and production, and the numbers we've we've been hearing about that you know by 2040 we, the demand is up 200 percent, for example, you know tripling by 2050. Um, there is a there is a perfect storm in supply and demand in in uranium, and so we're hoping to play run into that. And power metal investors will own 30 percent of this vehicle, but we'll have obviously huge exposure to those discoveries, but zero exposure to that exploration cost. That's all being done by a joint venture partner. So we think it's the optimum solution for our shareholders to achieve the most value uh, and to most rapidly, because we've now got the firepower, to most rapidly get those commercial discoveries that that we all want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks for sharing that. So Rick, you, you do a lot of uh, net asset valuations. Uh, Power Metals is in your portfolio, uh, they, they've been in, invited to the symposium, the rural symposium, where uh, only companies that you invest in. So when you're looking at what are you seeing when you're looking at power metals and obviously you have the the business model and then you have the the uh, the, the assets that they own. So when you're looking at valuation as such, like what, what are some things you're, you're considering there? My investment in power metals isn't based on net present value calculation. It's based on a process. Early in my career, from age sort of 21 to 51, for 30 years, I was involved doing for my own account what Sean is doing for Power Metal shareholders, which is to say I was getting in the ground floor of opportunities because I was creating the ground, I was creating the opportunities. I probably participated in the building of 40 shells at that period in time, and I probably assisted in one way, shape, or form with another 40 or 50 companies coming public. Uh, I'm too old. Uh, and have too many responsibilities to do that anymore. The process of creating the, the ground floor is hard work. It takes a lot of time. There's a lot of moving parts. And, and I have other things to do with my life now. I can't do it. But it was enormously rewarding. Uh, and so rather than do it myself, as a shareholder of Power Metal, <laughs> I let Sean do it for me. Um, you know, everybody always says, how do I get on the ground floor? And the most certain way to get on the ground floor is to create the ground floor. Uh, find the assets, assemble the team, find the shell, or build the t build the shell. Have the as have the shell available for teams. Uh, this is a process. It's labor intensive. Uh, there's a lot of brain strain involved dealing with entrepreneurs, regulators, exchanges, brokers, and stuff like that. And in my declining years, I would prefer that Sean did it rather than Rick do it. Uh, yeah, although I still want to participate in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, uh, Sean. Sean, you got anything you want to add to that? 
Well, for, I think the most obvious thing is I think I speak on behalf of investors all around the world that we hope you're not in your declining years just yet. You're a very uh, important participant and a, uh, a you know a, a very important I think a role model as much as anything else for for those of us in the junior space. But look, we're we're very privileged to have you. As, as a shareholder, it's obviously great for us to have the validation of your experience. And I know we've talked about the experience you had with Dundee Corporation and you made a lot of money with those guys. And, you know, look, if we can if we can achieve half of what those guys have achieved, I think we'll be doing a great job. And I think the incubator model, um, well, obviously, I would say this, but I think it has a, a part to play in every uh, mining portfolio because it offers a slightly different blend of risk to the kind of single asset junior model that, that we're also familiar with. Um, for us, it's not just about making the discoveries, it's about optimizing the capital structure, the crystallization event, the exit. Um, and as you say, there are a tremendous amount of moving parts at any one time. Um, we're focusing at the moment in terms of our messaging on a Iranian business, but of course we have listed investments that have done extremely well. Guardian Metal Resources, its current market cap and our 45% shareholding means that it's it takes up roughly all of my market cap in evaluation. So this exciting uranium opportunity, investors are getting almost for free. That's before we talk about what we're doing in the um, in the Arabian Shield, what we're doing in Botswana with our nickel business, what we're doing with our Australian assets, uh, and so on. So there is a lot of value, and of course that's you know a function of where the markets have been, and we we all know that. But I'm sure that what we can do is continue to deliver those. Uh, those, those entry points and, and those crystallization events. And I think over time, I'm sure that we will reward shareholders. And, uh, and obviously, you know, we, want, uh, we want Rick to be right at the, the top of that list, which, uh, which we're happy to say that he is. So it's, it's a great pl pleasure to be here and, and, to, and to present the story, to get that focus on, on what we're talking about at the moment in Uranium. But if any, if any uh, investors want further information about power overall, you know, I'm the real the, the the front man for the IR, so I'm very happy to take direct messages or, or calls if anybody wants to get a bit more into the uh, into the model. And it'd be my pleasure to help investors to better understand what we're trying to do. Yes, yeah. So, so could you speak to, uh, more to the incubator model? Uh, so, uh, I'm I'm just looking at the the corporate presentation now, and the incubate the incubator model seems like it gives you a degree of uh, flexibility. Uh, when you're when you're uh, running into these these uh, projects, uh, when you're acquiring opportunities, whether you go jo joint venture or you decide to um, explore uh, internally, and so uh, could you speak more to that to that model? Yeah, I think that's 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 right, and I think it's important to understand also that you know an incubator is not just a, a land bank. You know, we're not just buying a collection of licenses which are prospective for a certain commodity, waiting for that commodity to go up and then to sell that land on. I mean, obviously there are people who do that and that, that's been fairly common in the uranium space but fundamentally our job is to add value to those assets and to those license areas and that means exploration and making discoveries now that's easier said than done as we said earlier that requires cash time uh, obviously high quality geochemistry and and all the other elements that go into being able to make a discovery and being able to measure twice cut once all those sort of factors that maximize your opportunity for discovery so my job really is to uh, is to create the ideal conditions so that those discoveries can happen and that means either an ipo with external investors if you take guardian metal for example we brought in a number of investors in the us who really understand the strategic importance of tungsten to the us defense industry and we're now um, looking forward we hope to receiving a grant from the dod from the department of defense to help to to build out the pilot mountain asset which is the the most important part of Guardian Metal. Um, and the IPO was the right route for that because DOD wants to put some cash in, we believe, and that will bring with it some match funding, most likely from, from US investors. So it was important that that company existed in the in the public domain. The Iranian business, on the other hand, uh, at this point, it's it's very early days. We need to we need to really sort of get going on the ground. And I think at the moment a joint venture structure makes most sense. We, we we can get it to a certain point and then you know the options are open for how we would take it on from there and of course you know the 70 percent shareholder will will obviously have the major say in how that's done but it could be a merger with another explorer developer it could be an ipo it could be something else but it's an iterative process so you know the incubation is not just about 
owning assets and sitting on them in, in a way that an asset manager would necessarily. It's about actively adding value to those assets through exploration work or ge geological work, uh, and then finding the, the best route to crystallize that, whether it's joint venture IPO, outright sale, having a smaller stake, diluting, you know, for for the for a, for a bigger uh, for a share of a bigger pie, or or whatever the case may be. So, you've got a blend of experienced people. I you you can't just have a, a group of geologists. You equally you can't just have a group of finance guys. You have to have a blended experience. You have we have um, an excellent COO who helps us manage the business. There's a lot of um, process involved in in these transactions. Obviously, we have high quality geologists, and what I what I hope to bring to this is a reasonable amount of capital markets experience and and the networking connections in the capital markets that can help get these deals over the line. So working all together as a group, I think we are in a position where we are, I believe, adding a lot of value and we'll continue to do so. And I hope that that will, in the long term, be reflected in the share price and the value for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking just a little bit to uh, the defense uh, metals, like obviously tungsten. Uh, so I was uh, reading an article recently where it talked about the significant increase in defense spending by uh, uh, nations all across the, the world. Right. Um, and I think right now it's about uh, a two point four trillion dollar uh, industry annually. And uh, that's how much is invested in this sector. And so, um, I mean, it, it seems like that's that's something that um, that I've been I've been seeing. I've also been looking at some of the defense sector stocks and they've they've been rising significantly. And so, um, you know, it seems like that's something that's not really getting a lot of uh, mainstream news. Um, but um, it's obviously you're you're supplying a metal that is that is critical for this particular sector that countries are are spending significant amounts of money in yes and 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 you look fundamentally it's about security supply i mean if you you know the the chinese control a huge amount of the the tungsten market and you know they can they could switch that off at, at any time i mean we we've seen some of that in in the antimony market for example and and tungsten is 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 critical um so the u.s quite understandably, wants to build its own domestic supply. We have the largest, or I should say Guardian Metal has, and we are a shareholder in it, has the largest undeveloped uh, asset in tungsten in the US. Um, and it's it's absolutely critical, which is why we're expecting the support of the US government to help develop that. So that security of supply underpins uranium just as much. I mean, if you think about the, the big producers, I mean, Canada is only 27% of uranium supply you've got niger you've got kazakhstan you know and these are not necessarily uh geographies on which you could you know, in the very long term hang your hat now you know one wouldn't want to get too carried away on geopolitics for the purposes of this call but i think it's clear to to investors generally that having the supply coming from friendly jurisdictions tier one jurisdictions uh you know is is, is preferable particularly in the light of what you were saying at the top about the the tech companies. So security of supply is as important as the overall supply demand balance or imbalance. Uh, and that's particularly, as I said, acute in both the uranium and in tungsten, in which we are both very heavily exposed. Yeah, yeah. So Rick, I, I would love to give your get your uh, take on like this, this trend in defense spending. Um, obviously, they're going to need the commodities that that um, that are needed for whatever they're building, weapons, infrastructure, whatever. Um, but uh, I wanted to get to see if you if you had any any take on the trend with how much trillions are being spent in in defense. Well, Daryl, as you know from my frequent protestations, I'm a taxpayer, uh, so I pay, I pay attention to those trillions constantly because they all seem to come from me. Uh, my wish is that. Uh, we didn't feel we needed a defense budget. <clears throat> That's a narrative wish. Uh, I wish that the problems in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe uh, would be solved and that the voters felt that there wasn't a need for a defense budget. But my, you know, if my wishes were fishes, right? <clears throat> the truth is, in terms of conventional weaponry, we're using a lot of it right now in the Middle East and we're using uh, a lot of it uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, this isn't... Uh, for some materials uh, like nickel and copper, uh, uh, a forward-looking item. It's a replacement item. 
certainly in terms of technology, uh, the question becomes with future weapon systems, uh, how do we deal with the fact that our relationships, as an example, with China are less friendly? And that's where the tungsten comes from. It's where the rare earths come from. It's where the vanadium comes from. It's where the processed lithium comes from. Uh, I think these are important considerations. Uh, I think, too, that despite the fact that the, that the vanadium and the lithium doesn't care where it comes from, the supply chain does, co does care. Uh, and I think that you're going to see uh, the U.S. Congress uh, <laughs> find a way to favor domestic production. Uh, it's interesting, Daryl, when I look back five years, uh, Congress, had they known I existed, and I pray they don't, would have vilified me for investing in U.S. uranium. Last year, they decided to give me $5.6 billion in subsidies. I use I parenthetically for the U.S. uranium industry. And while as a taxpayer, I think it's despicable that they're going to do this, uh, given the fact that they're going to steal from my right pocket, I'm delighted with the fact that they're going to put some money in my left pocket. Uh, if it seems to you like I'm saying that this is a mixed, bliss, a mixed blessing, indeed it is. But I think that forward-thinking investors, without considering defense, uh, are cutting themselves out of what will shape up to be an important industry. I would ask your listeners to understand that these very small markets, vanadium, titanium, never mind gallium and germanium, uh, stuff like that, are extremely volatile. And most of the money uh, that Sean proposes to make you will likely be made in bigger markets. They will likely be made in precious metals markets. They'll likely be made in copper and nickel markets. They'll likely be made in copper markets because these are big markets. Uh, but if you have the good fortune to stumble on a minor deposit that uh, is in the lowest cost quartile and the highest return on capital employed quartile in its sector, you, you can make a whale of a lot of money. Uh, and it's important to understand that you are in a sector that nobody's paid attention to for 40 or 50 years. So getting in on the ground floor, not merely in terms of creating the opportunity, but also in terms of understanding the market it isn't as under, it isn't as difficult to compete in terms of understanding in a market that nobody understands. <laughs> you you are less far behind the eight ball than you otherwise would be as a speculator. I hope that rant made sense. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, okay, yeah, appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so, transitioning into, uh, I do want to talk about gold and silver. Uh, so, Rick, I know you had put out uh, some numbers for gold and just adjusted for inflation, and we're approaching. Um, those numbers pretty pretty fast uh, right now gold uh, I'm looking at the the numbers it's about 2761 yep. uh, and then silver was flirting with $35 an ounce uh, you know I, I was a uh, I was a uh, bearish on silver for a little while you know I was disheartened by silver for a little while was, silver can be a heartbreaker at times but now I'm I, I didn't sell my physical and and I still own some shares and so um I, I do want to uh get your take on what are we seeing with gold now? I mean, it's, it's getting pretty close to that, that, um, that inf inflation adjusted price. And so uh, what's your outlook there? I know bank of America says $3,000 by mid 2020, 2025. Uh, what's, what's your outlook? I'm a bank of America customer, so I wouldn't pay attention to anything they say. <laughs> uh, they have me sullen, but not yet mutinous. And I ought to be in love with them anyway. Uh, let's look at gold. And, and and I've said this in your show before, Daryl. I don't own gold because I think it might crest through 2,700 or 2,300 or 3,000 or some number like that. I own it because I'm afraid it's going to go to $9,000 or $10,000. Now, is that outlandish? Let's look at history. In the period 1970 to 1980, the gold price went from an admittedly price controlled $35 to $850. Uh, what's that, a 25-fold move, something like that? Uh, just for fun, let's throw away the first uh, 60 $70. The move from 35 to 100 probably happened because they took the price controls off. So in 10 years, it only went from 100 to 850 In other words, it was only an eight-bagger. Let's dial that up, the period 2000 to 2010. The gold price went from $253 to $1,750. 
uh, fear about weakness in the purchasing power of fiat currencies. Are those are, are those fears well founded today, Daryl? The on balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. government exceed thirty five trillion dollars. I remember a year ago you thought you were in debt. <laughs> You're a piker, man. And then. The off-balance sheet liabilities, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Securities, military pensions, all that, that number is $100 trillion. And we're going to service $135 trillion in debt with a budget that's in deficit, $2 trillion a year. How are we going to do that? Rhetorical question. We're going to do it by, <clears throat> we're not going to pay Social Security recipients less. We're going to pay them their $2,200 or $2,300 or $2,000 or whatever it is. We're going to inflate away the net present value of the obligation. In the 1970s, according to the U.S. federal government, not some cranky old bald white libertarian, uh, we inflated away 75% of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. And the gold price went from $35 to $850. This isn't tough stuff. Uh, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to inflate away 75% of the net present value of our obligations. In fact, I would argue with you that in the period 2000 to 2024, the last 24 years that we've gone through, the gold price has gone from uh, $252 an ounce to $2,700, something like that. I would argue that in terms of purchasing power, gold's hardly gone up at all. What happened is that the U.S. dollar went down. Think how much you made in your salary in 2000. Uh, think how much your car payment was. Think how much your car cost. Think how much your groceries cost. And I would argue that the same thing is going to happen now. I just think that the pace of change is going to accelerate that the pace of the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is going to accelerate and likely as a consequence that the nominal price of gold in U.S. dollar terms increases at a faster rate too. I'll leave you with one more thing, Daryl, before uh, you go back to Sean. And I said it on your show before, but I assume that some listeners now didn't listen then. The market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets in the North American market, the United States and Canada, is less than one half of 1%, which is to say that one half of 1% of savings and investment assets in the North American market uh, is comprised of precious metals or precious metals related securities. The four decade mean is 2%. Gold doesn't have to win the war against the treasuries. The dollar doesn't have to collapse. All we have to do is return to historical means. If we return to the historical mean, the demand for gold and silver increases fourfold. Think about what that might do to a price. And when you're thinking about it, remember in the decade 2000 to 2010, the gold price went up sevenfold. Mm. I think in terms of the order of magnitude, that's a discussion that you have to have with yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, there's there's still a lot of lot of uh, uh, hype around uh, Costco selling out their bars, though. I don't know if you I don't know if you buy there, but <laughs> I, I don't buy there. But the fact that uh, <clears throat> uh, although I would urge people to consider having a dealer, uh, to the extent that there's a whole bunch of Americans who are interested in gold who don't have a dealer, uh, they can simply walk into Costco with a credit card uh, and make a discretionary purchase. The democratization of gold ownership in the United States is very similar to what the Chinese began to cause to occur six or seven years ago. And I think it's a very, very, very good thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. People ask me if Costco expanded the market. No, Costco made the market more accessible to a group of consumers that were already Costco customers. Wonderful. Yeah, you get everything you need in one place, right? Uh, so everything going, I need. <laughs> so go, going over to you, Sean. Um, I know uh, power metals, uh, gold is a a metal that uh, you all um, acquire assets in and and really really. 
put some focus there. And so I want to uh, give you time to, to speak towards uh, gold and as, as well as silver, silver too. I mean, silver's at $35 an ounce. And so just want to get your, get your take. Yes. Well, I mean, look, I, I certainly, uh, I, well, I, as ever, I, I share Rick's view on, uh, you know, on the, on the um, outlook for the price. And, and, and certainly I, I know very much his, his comment that, you know, the, the fear of gold going to those very, very high levels is a very, very important point. And I think that has a, you know, a wider implication for, for the whole commodity set, because we often see when, when these cycles turn and, and, and let's hope that, that it is, that it is turning is, is it so often led by, by gold and by, by gold stocks. So, we have we have good gold exposure in uh, in Botswana through our through our Tati project, um, and we've uh, entered into a, a joint venture arrangement there of a, a part of that asset where we're hoping to generate. Uh, well, obviously we're hoping to generate some great returns, but we're hoping to generate in the short term some some news there about some some advance. We also have a stake in a in a in a silver project uh, in Canada, which again is an opportunity for us to to monetize and to and to move forward. Um, and of course, we're you know we are we have some also some exposure in Australia, and we're looking always looking for for more opportunities there. I think, to be honest, precious metals has been a bit less of a focus for us over recent years as we've pivoted more into the sort of critical metals um, that are necessary for the energy transition. And obviously, uranium we've we've already spoken about, um, and uh, we have a lot of exposure in in nickel, uh, for example. We also rare earths and PGMs and and those other things as well. So um, it is an it is an important part of the of the asset set, but um, it's probably not the we, if if investors are saying how do I buy uranium in the UK market, they can come very clearly straight to power metal. I think how do I play gold in the UK market? I would say we're we're probably not the first choice, but we do have exposure. Um, and we certainly share the view on the on the outlook, but we have also, as I said, some exposure to silver as well. So um, we we hope to be able to bring more news on on all of that and and uh, the progress of those assets in the in the fullness of time. Yeah, yeah, and it's I mean that, that's like power metals is like that one stop shop, you know, <laughs> like where where you get some exposure well, to, to it, quite it, a bit different. Yeah, and, and uh, to, absolutely, and to Rick's very kind comments that you know he's he's looking to us to to, to do it for him, and I think. You know, to enlarge on that for a lot of investors, particularly many that we've met through Rick at, at his symposium, a lot of them will say, look, you know, I like lithium, but I don't know which stock to pick. I, I like gold. I like copper. I, you know, um, but it, I don't necessarily have the expertise to to build a portfolio myself. That's what we're, we're offering. We're saying, look, we have exposure you know, across the piece. Um, we hopefully are, are reasonably competent at managing it. Um, we think we can deliver a lot of value through enhanced capital structures and and timing, uh, as well as good geology and exploration, uh, and perhaps you know we we can be trusted to to deliver that portfolio return for you, and that that's certainly the way I want to sort of project the the model to people, and and hopefully that will uh, that will attract out their interest. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so, just as we wrap up, uh, you know, I would love to get any closing thoughts uh, from you all, and then also. Uh, where are some ways that the audience can connect connect with you? Uh, obviously, uh, Power Metals, uh, you all are on the London Exchange as well as the OTC. And so I love for you to uh, plug people there. And then, Rick, you, you have a lot of things going on. So uh, I want to give you all the opportunity to um, share, um, yeah, where people can connect with you. So uh, we'll go to Sean first and then uh, we'll go to Rick. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And as I, as I said earlier, um, you know, I really front the investor relations function in terms of direct market engagement. So I'm very happy for people to contact me directly. Um, we have info at powermetals.com, uh, sorry, uh, info at uh, powermetalresources.com um, as our sort of gateway, if you like. We obviously have a have a website, which I think has sort of some great information on it. Um, we are regular participants in RIC's uh, events, so you'll see us in the US. We have the US OTC listing that I mentioned, and we are intending over the the balance of this year to to come over to the US and and do some serious marketing to to really get that uh, that OTC listing going and get some liquidity on there. So um, hopefully we'll and, and of course we have you and I have have regular chats uh, and we're hoping to get more exposure to to investors in North America. So um, but if anybody wants to hear any more about us, please contact me and we'd be very happy to do one on one presentations or anything that that, that can help investors. 
All right, sounds great. Thanks, thanks, Sean and uh, Rick. What, what, how can people connect with you? Uh, what do you have going on? We just finished the tier one boot camp, uh, which for people who ca care about investing and speculating in very large deposits <clears throat> is really must listen work. Whether you're a dividend oriented investor or a front end speculator, uh, I would suspect that most of the money that you make over the course of your life will be concentrated in a few investments or speculations, and those will likely be around tier one deposits. Uh, $99 for the transcripts. They're timeless. If you buy the transcripts and you don't think you got your money's worth, email me. I'll give you your money back. Full money back guarantee. But my most consistent pitch is around education, and it's free. Go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. I personally will rank them, 1 to 10, 1 being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on individual issues where I think my comments might have value. That's ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. Please, no crypto. I don't know about crypto. Please, no tech stocks. Please, no pot stocks. Please, no bonds. I don't do those things. Natural resource stocks, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Thanks, Daryl. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, you all be sure to hit the subscribe button and everything if you enjoyed this content. Uh, Rick is a frequent guest as well as Sean. And so I uh, appreciate you all for tuning in and watching. And uh, until next time. Mm -hmm.